Okay, um, so today we'll be going over nurseries and seedlings. Um, this will build on what we did in tree improvement, and this will lead into uh, what we ended up doing on um, what we end up doing next class when we're talking about tree planting. So it'll all tie together. And so as we, we look at where we are for some context, when we're talking about having a nursery infrastructure and a tree improvement infrastructure, you're probably talking about intensive silviculture uh, because that's very expensive. And so to make that expense make sense, you're not doing natural regeneration. So you're often focused on using the trees you plant uh, to gain some economic return and make all that infrastructure pay for itself. That being said, there are many cases where you have nurseries and you plant trees for other objectives, restoration um, or simply afforestation. So there's a lot of areas out west where they will plant trees because it's the only way they're going to get a forest in that area. And so, for example, we're seeing a lot of these wildfires out west this year and in other years. And while you rarely get complete mortality on those, you'll get significant mortality. And so they may plant trees out there, they know it's gonna be on a really long rotation, they're never gonna make money on it, but they've got the budget to reestablish that forest. Um, so sometimes you'll see them used extensively. Uh, but we're still in the midst of our stand establishment unit here where we're talking about treatments to get a new stand going. So I wanna start uh, having you split up into groups and what you're gonna do, here's the scenario, you're working with a landowner who has a 126 acre stand. They want it planted at an eight by 12 foot spacing and you're gonna be using bare root open pollinated seedlings that are gonna cost you 70 bucks for a thousand of them. So in your group, figure out how many trees you order and how much just the seedlings are gonna cost. So what's the cost of just the seedlings? So go ahead, split up and work on that and we'll go over it once everyone has an answer. All right, so uh, who got about 57,000, 58,000 seedlings? Just show of hands. Anybody get anything else? So we're all 57, 58,000, give or take. Um, so to get to that, eight times 12 means there's 96 square feet per tree. 43, 560 over that means there's 454 trees per acre. And then we might have slightly different numbers because we rounded off what exactly that 454 was. I think it's like 453.75, right? If you want to be real technical. Multiply that by 126 acres, and that gives us a number somewhere around 57, 58,000, okay? Okay, and then uh, just quick show of hands who got somewhere around $4 million for their seedlings. Oh, I had a hand go up quick, but come down even quicker. That's the most common mistake I'll see. And so it's $70 per thousand seedlings, so sometimes you forget to divide that 70 by 1,000. And when you do that, it multiplies the cost by 1,000 which means you end up getting on this 126 acre tract about $4 million worth of trees. So if that mistake ever happens to you, hopefully you look at it and say, if I'm the landowner, am I gonna pay $4 million for seedlings for 126 acres? No. <laughs> so it's kind of a ludicrous mistake when you make it, if you can look at it and just try and make sense of the number. So everyone hopefully got somewhere uh, about $4,000, a little more than $4,000, yeah. Um, so the math is pretty straightforward, uh, but there's a few little wrinkles we want to think about here that I haven't taught you yet, so I wasn't expecting you to calculate it here. So if you go out on this 126 acre tract, how confident are you in your GIS? Could that be 134 acres? Could that be 118 acres? Especially with things like SMZs where they may be variable in width. So your acreage could be off by a little bit pretty easily. Um, on top of that, when you send out a hand or machine planting crew, how close do you think they're going to get to eight by 12 foot exactly across the whole stand? If they go a little tighter, you've got more trees you're planting. If they go a little wider, you have less trees that you're planting. So that may be a little bit variable. Um, and so then the other thing to think about, you're buying these seedlings from the nursery. And so if you get bare root trees, here's a box with a thousand trees in it. How many of those boxes do you think have exactly a thousand trees in them? Probably none. <laughs> so what they'll do is they'll count out a number of seedlings and weigh them and they'll figure out that number to weight ratio. And then they can just weigh all the boxes and they don't have to worry about counting them. That just wouldn't be efficient. Um, these nurseries may be producing 50 million seedlings in a year. You don't want to count 50 million seedlings. And so as they're doing this, if you get slightly heavier seedlings than average, you might get fewer in a box. If you get slightly lighter seedlings than average, you might get more in a box. It's gonna be pretty close to a thousand. The nurseries are businesses. They wanna keep you as a customer, right? 
They don't want you unhappy. Of course, if you get containerized seedlings, they're in a tray with so many seedlings, that may be closer to the right number, but you may still have a few that died and didn't make it in that plug, so it may not be quite what you expect. Um, so the number of trees you get may be off by a little. Here's the other thing to think about, okay? Imagine the person that's riding in that cab on the machine planter and they're putting the seedlings into the machine planter and it's putting them in the ground. If they pick up a seedling and it's a runt of a seedling, it's real small, it's got yellowish needles, what do you want, want them to do with that? Chuck it. You want them to be able to cull trees. So you are spending the time to get them out on the ground to put all these trees in the ground. You've bought all the trees and you're trying to grow them into a nice stand that you'll harvest in maybe 25 plus years. You don't want to waste that growing spot for two and a half decades on just some crappy tree they threw in the ground. So you want them to be able to cull trees. So depending on the nursery, you might have more or less culls depending on how they grew those seedlings. Now, if this is a nursery that's real good, you might have 3% culls or something. They might be really good trees. If this is hardwoods we're talking about, you might want to cull 20% of them, 25% of them. You might want to be real picky out there because you'll get a lot of forked ones. You'll get ones with curved root stocks. You'll get a lot of forms that you just don't want that aren't going to make you a good stand. And so you may need a really high cull percentage, which is painful because those are really expensive seedlings. Those are costing you four or five times as much um, as that $70 a thousand. So they're expensive trees. But so you have to account for all these factors. Um, the other thing that we didn't think about, so who wrote, wrote out a number of seedlings that's something like 57,038 seedlings? Yeah, you know, so that's precise mathematically, but is the nursery going to give you just the 38 seedlings? If you go in there right now and you say, I want 38 trees to plant in my backyard, they will sell you 38 trees. They're going to charge you a little bit more per tree, but they'll sell you the trees. But in an order of this size, you're getting boxes of 1,000 seedlings they're probably not gonna worry about an overage of, you know, just an extra 38 trees. So here's how we account for all that. So you all got to that 57,000 something correctly. Then what you would do is you would take that number, whatever it is, so maybe it's 57,038. You multiply it by 1.1. So that accounts for our coal seedlings. And so that's gonna add another, you know, 5,700 seedlings. So that's going to give me something like 62,700 um, or 500, you know, and probably 600. So now I'm up to 62,600 seedlings. And then again, they're selling them in boxes of 1,000 for the most part. So what do I actually order? 63,000 63, seedlings. So you order 63,000. So multiply it by 1.1, assuming a 10% call, and then round it up to the nearest 1,000. And that'll have us all doing the same math all semester. So if we do this on a quiz, all of us should have the same answer, okay? But again, that 10% call, that's not a science of silviculture. That's an art of silviculture. If you're working with a great nursery that does very well in your area and you get to know them and a 3% call is working for you, that number becomes 3%. If you're planting hardwoods and you want them for a timber stand, that number may become 20%. So you're adjusting that number based on what's working for you with your operation. So any questions on uh, how many seedlings to order? Typically with a lot of these nurseries, what you would do, and they've adjusted due to COVID, but often in a normal year, what you would do is you would call and place an order. And if you pay about a third of the money by October, you have those seedlings reserved because they only have so many seedlings. They planted them back in April. So if they have 50 million, they have 50 million. So, um, and then when you're ready to plant, you call them, and a container nursery will just give you your containers because they don't have to do anything to them really, just pack them up for you. A bare root nursery may lift them in the few days before you come to get them, so they're as fresh as possible. So. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about nurseries at the end here today, but until then what I wanna do is talk about the genetics that we can get as seedlings from a nursery. Now, many of what we're gonna talk about, many of these options won't be available for hardwoods. You just get what you get, they don't have any options. Um, it's just some guy went out and collected acorns and gave them to the nursery and they grew them out. And those are the trees. Um, maybe they're from Houston County. Maybe they're from Nacogdoches County. Maybe they're from Arkansas. It's wherever they got the acorns from. You don't even know if the provenance is necessarily right. So it's the wild, wild west with hardwood seedlings. We have a lot more options with our pine seedlings because of all that breeding that we talked about last class. Most of the seedlings sold in the south 
are going to be open pollinated. So the mother tree is in the seed orchard. So remember, all our pines are monoecious. So that mother tree is also the father tree where the pollen is being released and uh, pollinating other mother trees in the orchard. But you know you, where you got the seed from, so you know that's the mother tree. But the seed cone was left open. <laughs> pollen could have come from absolutely anywhere, natural pollination. Studies have shown about half that pollen comes from outside the orchard. Some of the pollen coming from outside the orchard may be improved uh, because you may have a plantation a mile away where you planted improved trees. So it may be improved, it may not be. And so you have the improved mother, your father may be improved, it may be not, you don't know, you don't know what the father is. So these are called half sib seedlings. Uh, your brother's ditty isn't necessarily your ditty. So think of these as uh, step siblings. So that's what you're getting with an OP tree. You know the mother, the mother's improved, you know nothing about the father. That's most of our seedlings and they grow pretty well. We have an increasing trend now where we're planting mass control pollinated trees. And so here's what mass control pollination is. It depends the timing of it on whether you have loblolly pine or slash pine, but what they'll do is they will go out as the female strobili start to become receptive, right before they're receptive to pollination and they bag them. They put a waxy paper bag on top of them and that keeps any pollen from hitting that strobili. Um, so they'll be out there in 50 cherry pickers here, bucket trucks. It's a very time and labor intensive operation. If it's raining during those particular week or two of the year when they have to do this, you may not get a crop, you know, established in that year. So they bag them, then they'll pollinate them. Again, we're dealing with a Manisha species, so they will have gone and collected pollen from some of the same pines that they're going to use for this in the seed orchard. Um, and so they'll have that pollen. The pollen's kind of gross. They put it in these clear leader, you know, Nalgene sort of plastic jars. And it's such a fine sized smart particle that as you move these jars back and forth, it looks like a fluid, like it moves like a liquid in there. So it's like a super fine sifted uh, flower. But, um, you know, the people that collect the, the pollen and get it and process it and all that, you know, talking to the folks at the seed orchards, those people are just like sneezing all the time. Like, uh, allergists will tell you pine pollen doesn't cause allergies, it's too big, but when you get that much of it, it certainly does. So they know the father tree on that pollen they are injecting. So uh, he's blowing it in. They often have pneumatic, you know, guns now that do it so you don't have to blow on it. Uh, but you know the mother and you know the father now. And so the mother's in the seed orchard. The pollen was taken from a known father, often in the seed orchard. It, it's injected at just the right time. And then think about what you have to do from there. So I've injected this in April, 2020. When am I pulling that seed out of there? October, 2021. So now I have to track which cones I injected with which male pollen on which limbs. So ideally you're gonna do the whole tree uh, or as many of the cones as you can get to. But if I missed bagging a female strobili on there, then that's a cone that's OP, not MCP. So I gotta keep track of all this. So again, it's, it's a very complex operation just to keep track of all this out in the woods over multiple years. So I've been calling this MCP, mass control pollination, Arborgen trademarked that. So the other companies will sell you control mass pollinated seedlings or CMP. It's the same exact thing. Um, but these are gonna be full sim families. And so you know the father and you know the mother. So when you plant out a plantation that's MCP, those trees are the offspring of the same two great parent trees. So it's a full sib family. Midwest Vaco started this in 1993. Uh, they expanded it in 2002. And these first became publicly available about 2004. Um, so they've been available to the public for about 16 years. This is getting pretty big. We're up to the point where they're sending out about 140 million of these seedlings per year across IFCO, Arborgen, all the companies that are producing these seedlings. A lot of that goes to industry land, but more and more of it's going to private landowners as well. So for context, we're planting between 800 million and a billion seedlings a year. So we're looking at, you know, 15 to 20% MCP. Uh, so this is a significant amount. It's 20% of all pine seedlings sold. And so you're looking at over a period of time there, 2 million acres southwide having been established in MCPs already. So that's pretty significant. 
So we're planting a lot of these. They tend to be really, really uniform. When you see these stands, you might think it's a varietal stand. The uniformity is often great. The form on them's great. They're disease resistant. They are only putting the best genetics into this. They're, they're not gonna put their mediocre genetics and take all the time to do all this. So they're only using those elite crosses that they have tested and no produce elite offspring. And here's the value of it. So natural unimproved pine, no genetic gain because you're comparing it to itself on the left there. If you take a, a good mother tree and you let it open pollinate, you may get a 21% volume gain. So we saw that, that's an average second generation of tree improvement number. Well, if you take the single best parent in that orchard, we now may be looking at a 37% volume gain, so getting pretty impressive. But instead, if we take the best two parents and cross them, and we've tested to make sure they work well together, they don't always, but they work well together, you may get about a 50% increase in volume. And so you're getting good volume, good form, good disease resistance. These are really nice trees. So next up, so that was MCP. Next up, we have varietals. Yeah, Chris. What's the difference in prices? I've got price slides here in a minute. Yeah, we'll definitely look at that because that's a really important thing to know, right? Um, so yeah, we'll definitely look at that, Chris. Okay, before we get to that low, let's talk about one more option here, which is varietals. So these are our clonal trees. So here's a, a diagram from Arborgen that gets at the idea of clonal forestry. On the left, if you plant a stand that's OP, so they all have a good mother tree, you're gonna have mostly average trees in that plantation from the middle of your normal distribution. You've got a few crummy trees in red there, you've got a few pretty good trees in yellow, and then you have a small number of just awesome trees in dark green. But if you could clone the best tree, look at the right. That's varietal forestry, where every tree in your stand is the best tree in an OP stand. And so that's the promise here. So let me draw an analogy for you. This wrestling rink is like an OP forest. You've got genetic variability amongst your different wrestlers there. But clearly there's one outlier in the middle there. So there's Andre the Giant at seven plus feet, 500 plus pounds, drinking 90 beers a night. Um, how much more would you pay to go see that if it was 10 Andre the Giants wrestling each other? That would be a much cooler wrestling match. So that's the idea behind clonal forestry. Make every tree in your forest an Andre the Giant. Take that bizarre genetic outlier and now that's your entire forest. And so we've only done this a little bit. This data is over a decade old, so take it with a grain of salt, but we think we can double volume with these weird genetic freaks that we're putting out there. Um, as of 2009, they planted about 11 million of these, so it's minor compared to everything else we're doing. Um, and so just a few tens of thousands of acres. And the barrier there to Chris's point is the cost. You'll see why people aren't doing this everywhere when I show you the costs. So how do we get these bizarre genetic individuals and clone them? Well, they tried rooted cuttings. So they tried taking clippings and putting hormones on them and getting them to root. That's how they clone most of the eucalyptus that they clone. They couldn't get it scaled operationally in lava olive pine. They had a lot of disease issues they couldn't overcome. So they abandoned that. And now they're using this complex process called somatic embryogenesis. So we're not gonna get into detail in all those different steps. But the take home message you need to know is you're not taking a clipping from an existing awesome tree and making more copies of it. You are taking a seed. And instead of growing one tree from that seed, you're growing millions of trees from that seed that are all identical. And so think about the seed ecology lab you all did uh, where you got your seeds from Arborgen, you put them on the Petri dish, you germinated them in the growth chamber. When you were holding that seed in your hand, did you know how good it was? How good a tree it was gonna make? You have no idea. Even if you have two elite parents that you've crossed, that doesn't mean they have elite offspring, right? And so you have no idea what the potential of that tree is. So you're gonna spend a lot of time and money going through this whole process and growing them out into trees and selling them if you don't know how good they are? No, that makes no sense at all. So you have to test them. So here's what you do. You go through that process. You cryogenically preserve most of those embryos. And so you've got them in liquid nitrogen, they're stored. And then what you do is you take a few of them and you put them in a clonal plantation. It's very similar to the progeny test we talked about last class. So you plant them out over a number of different sites, great silviculture, uniform sites. So you're trying to see what the effect of genetics is. And after about six years, you'll be able to look at these clonal tests and say, that tree is our winner. It's the biggest tree on this site. It has great branching characteristics. We know there's fusiform rust on this site and it has no sign of it. 
It's just all the little things we're looking for in terms of morphology, growth, everything's good on this tree. And, you know, one in a thousand will make the cut. It has to be just a perfect tree that they're doing this with. That weird genetic freak, well, then you go, you pull the other embryos out of cryogenic storage, and you start selling millions of these clonal trees. So that's the idea behind clonal forestry. And this is what it can look like. So if you didn't know those trees were clones, what would you think had happened to that stand silviculturally? Does that look like a pine plantation you've ever been in? No. Looks like what's happened. Yeah, it looks like they've been pruned. What else looks like it's happened? Do you usually have that much space in between them? Look, looks like it's just been thin or something, right? So that's a really weird look. Um, this was probably a clone of AA93 that they got out of Midwest FACO's early rooted cuttings program. Um, but it is just a weird individual. It has that tiny little crown without much in the way of needles, but it photosynthesizes like crazy and grows this huge straight stem without forking. And so just this weird individual. Um, I worked with clonal lava like pine for my PhD research. And when we were looking at it, I started comparing what some of these different lava like pine clones were doing with studies already published. And these lava like pine clones are as different from one another as lava like pine as a species is from sweet gum. So you really, when you start looking at these individual clones, you start have to look at them and think, I have to almost treat these like two different species. This is just not lava like pine like lava like pine. You have to know what that's clone, that clone is doing and treat it that way. And so again, if, if I look back here, this would have been just one tree or two trees in a normal OP pollinated stand. You wouldn't have even noticed it or worried about it or anything like that. But now it's every tree in your plantation. And so you start getting weird things going on like this. So think about the context here. Could I have fit twice as many of those per acre? Maybe. I could double stocking from what I think is normal. All of a sudden I'm carrying some 300 square feet per acre basal area stand, but it's working. So you could do something weird like that. What about that tree in silvo pasture? I could probably go grass underneath these things right now, run silvo pasture, and still have as many trees per acre as I would in a normal pine plantation. So there's all sorts of different weird things you need to start thinking about with varietal silviculture. But, you know, we're still early in this because they're pretty expensive. And the costs mean there's not that many of them out there. Yeah, Will. Uh, I believe what they're doing is converting an existing forest into agroforestry. So they're not planting it at all. They're thinning it and establishing the grasses. Um, so I believe that was an old plantation, but it was probably open pollinated or uh, orchard bulk mix. The old state nurseries, what they would used to do, they wouldn't even do open pollinated. They would just take all the seed they gathered from all the other mother trees, mix it together, and that's what you got. So you didn't know the mother or the father, but you knew the mother was improved. Um, but the, the companies, Arbor Genifico, they're not selling orchard bulk mix anymore, so. Okay, so those are the options, and we'll get to costs in a moment, but before we get to costs, it's really important to understand that your genetics don't stand alone. So without the right silviculture, it doesn't matter what genetics you've got, okay? And this data here will sort of help us look at that. We're lucky with lava like pine in the south. We do not have many genetic by environment interactions. If we did, that would mean you would go to a nursery and you say, I want seedlings. And they would ask, well, are you gonna plant a wet site, a dry site, or an intermediate site? Because we have different trees you have to plant for each of them. Because the wet site trees are the smallest on the dry site and the dry site trees are smallest on the wet site. Fortunately, what we find with lava like pine is the best trees are the best trees on any site and the worst trees are the worst trees on any site. And so that's what this graph shows. As site quality increases to the right in terms of productivity, the best families there at the top yield more and more productivity. The poorer families do better on the better sites than they do on the poorer sites, but they're still the worst families. So as we look at this figure, there's a few take home messages. So look to the left there. We've got a crappy site. Do your genetics matter on a crappy site? Not very much. The best family will still be the best, but if it's 20% better than the poorer family, 20% of a small number is an even smaller number, okay? On the good sites, are your genetics important? Yeah, so 20% of a bigger number is a bigger number, right? And so genetics are much more important on the better sites because that's where you really have the potential to make a lot of money. The other thing we have to think about is site quality is not fixed. 
So if I apply fertilizer, do good competition control, um, fix any compaction or other issues with the site with mechanical site prep, I can move my site from left to right on here, okay? And as you're moving it from left to right, if you have the best genetics out there, what you're spending on those treatments is yielding you greater and greater returns, right? So it's more and more worth it to do those treatments. So kind of a complex figure, but the take home message is simple. The best silviculture on the best sites with the best genetics. That's the recommendation. If you just throw the best genetics out there and hope the genetics are gonna do everything for you, you wasted your money on good genetics. Unless you tie it into silviculture, it's not gonna get you what you hope for. Here's another study that really drives that message home. Uh, this was a study on clonal eucalyptus uh, in South America. Uh, the guy standing in that photo in the bottom figure there uh, is Jose Stapi. He's done a lot of his work in his career in Brazil with eucalyptus, but he was at NC State for a while. And this is a study he put in in Brazil with those clonal eucalypts. And what, you, what you'll notice, if you look to the left of him, all those trees are extraordinarily uniform. Large trees, all about the same size, all about the same form. But if you look to the right of him, you'll notice that those trees vary widely in size, a little bit different in form, big differences. Every tree you see in that photo is a clone. So every tree in that photo is a remet of the same clone. They're all genetically identical to one another. The difference is the trees on the left, they had them all planted out on the same day. The trees on the right, they varied the timing when they planted them. Okay, so they didn't plant them all on the same day. So the smaller ones were planted later, the larger ones were planted earlier. So they intentionally introduced variability without changing any of their silviculture and without changing any of the genetics. And look at the variability they got. And so what they figured out doing this big study, 80% of uniformity is attributable to silviculture in a clonal eucalyptus stain, okay? So even if you have as little gene genetic variability as possible, if you don't have the right silviculture, you're gonna get a lot of variability. Think about the Foshi varietal stand we saw week two in lab. That stand was not perfectly uniform, right? Because the silviculture was good operational silviculture that we do now, but if you had wanted it to be perfectly uniform, you need a lot more weed control out there, okay? So you've gotta get the silviculture right if you are managing with elite genetics. And what they found is greater uniformity actually increases volume. So more uniformity, higher overall volume, and you actually get a 13% increase um, in growth just with more uniformity, not to mention the increase in value. So silviculture is important, mixing it with the genetics. I think we talked about this in here a little bit last class, but there's a risk to all this, okay? If I plant one clone out over a thousand acres, that clone is already covered for the risks I know about. If I plant it out, I've picked a clone that's resistant to fusiform rust because I know fusiform rust is a problem. So fusiform rust is not a risk. New things are a risk. So if I put out 500 acres in a clonal plantation and then that 2011 drought hit, a once in 500 year drought, and that particular genotype was susceptible to drought mortality, you may lose your whole stand. If, if you had done an open pollinated plantation, there's genetic diversity there from the different father trees and so maybe you lose some trees, but not the whole stand. Diversity hedges against an unknown risk, a new risk. And so if we get, you know, the emerald pine beetle suddenly coming in and your one genotype that you have over 500, 1,000 acres is susceptible to it, you lose the whole stand. But if there's genetic diversity out there, you may not lose the whole stand. So there's a trade-off between going with these really constrained genetics, but high productivity, and then having these unknown risks and potentially losing the whole stand. So there is a trade-off. Even today, if you look at companies around here that are managing half a million to a million acres of land, they may be planting five, six OP families across that whole acreage. So they may already have pretty low diversity being deployed out there because those are the best trees we've got. If you're gonna plant a varietal plant stand or an MCP stand, you're doing it to get that uniformity because that gives you more growth, more value, easier to log. That's why you're doing it. So you don't want to mix a bunch of clones. That would be, that would defeat the whole purpose. But what you could do instead of planting your thousand acres all in one clone, plant 30 acres in clone A, 30 acres in clone B, 30 acres in clone C. And that way you have within stand uniformity, but you have diversity between stands. So if that new disturbance comes through, you may lose stand A 
but stand B may be okay. They have much less mortality. So that's how you build diversity in on the property level. So, so things to think about. So here, here's your question, Chris. So uh, the orange bars, the taller bars are containerized. The lower bars, the blue bars are bare root. So a number of you emailed me questions this morning. Containerized seedlings cost you about uh, nine cents more per seedling or about $90 more per thousand seedlings, give or take. So you can see that added cost there. Um, and then here's our different genetics increasing from left to, to right. So our half sim trees, those are our OP trees. Good, better, best. You may be able to buy better trees, bare root for $70 a thousand, okay? If a tree is seven cents, a thousand trees are $70. $170 a thousand to get those same trees containerized. And then you can see you bump up to full sibs. So that's our MCP. So it went up from $80 a thousand to $180 a thousand bare root. That's why we're not planting MCP everywhere. It's an extra hundred bucks, a thousand trees. That's less than a hundred dollars an acre. If you're only planting 600 trees an acre, that's an extra $60 an acre you're looking at in seedlings. But look at the varietals now, you know, they're four times as much to seven times as much, depending on how you look at it, um, what the um, OP trees are and the MCP trees are. Uh, 320 bucks a thousand for bare root. And if you're gonna plant varietals, I don't know why you would plant bare root. You probably need to go container and go ahead and spend the $420 a thousand. So there's no reason to save $100 a thousand, but then have your, you know, still $320 a thousand trees dying because they're bare root, not containerized. So spend the extra money there. Longleaf, you can't get bare root. Um, Longleaf, you don't have as much options in terms of the genetics. So some of these trees, we don't have as much breeding in. Here's the hardwoods, and you're starting in there at 250 bucks a thousand, and it goes up from there. You can't get all those hardwoods in any given year. So white oaks, it's really hard to keep white oak acorns without them germinating, so we can't keep them for long, uh, sometimes not even over winter. And so if white oaks didn't mass this year, you may not be able to buy white oak seedlings at the nursery the next year, right? And so whether you can get these trees in any given year, it's variable. So best thing to do is email the nursery, ask them for their species list, and they'll tell you what they've got. Um, you, you can buy these from nurseries around here, but they'll often ship them in from other states. The hardwood nursery might not be in East Texas, so they'll ship them in from Georgia or somewhere else. Where the seed came from, who knows? If you need to control where your seed comes from, you might have to collect it yourself or pay someone up to collect it for you and then work with the nursery to have them grow those seedlings out for you. Um, if you need that level of control. So. Okay, so we know we get better ge genetic gain, right? The varietals are 100% gain, MCPs 50%, OP second gen, good crosses 37%. We know we've got these different costs per thousand trees, okay? So what do you plant? Uh, this sort of gets at that idea. This is kind of a complex table. It's by Fred Raley out of the West Gulf Forestry Improvement Program. But the thing to keep in mind looking at all those numbers is all of them are marginal. And what marginal means is this is how much better each row is than the row above it. So when I look at the bottom left and the varietals having 16% genetic gain, that's compared to the row right above it. So they're 16% better than the full sieves. The full sieves have 14.9% more gain than the best half sieve family. The best half sieve family has 3.2% more gain than the top five gain groups, okay? So that's how it works. So the first column is how much genetic gain you get for each of them. The next column is cost. So you can see our varietals there at the bottom are $132.50 more expensive than the control mass pollinate, the MCP trees there. So you have the marginal cost. Then the two columns on the right, those are the net present values. So that third column, that's value per thousand seedlings. But what we really probably care about is the far right, value per acre. And you'll see it's just 60% of the value per thousand seedlings because they assumed you're planting 600 trees per year. So this is all model data. Model data can be wrong, it can be misleading, but this gives us some simple take home messages. So as we look at the far right column, it's telling you that each 1% genetic gain, if you plant that plantation out, it's gonna grow your trees better to the point that when you discount those extra revenues when you harvest them all the way back to when you plant them, the net present value on that is $6.53 for each 1% of genetic gain. So as we look at the four numbers in the bottom right of this table, are any of them negative? 
none of them are negative, which means if you're asking your quest, yourself a question, should I go with slightly better genetics? The answer is always, it'll make you more money, okay? But it's gonna cost you more to establishment. So if you're on a limited budget, it may not be an, as much of an option. If you're putting these out on a low quality site, this may not be true. This model was for site index 70. You'd get a different output for site index 50, right? So the numbers would not be this favorable on site index 50. So on an average site, a good site, sure, it's worth it. But then what else are you gonna do silviculturally? If, if you're in a mind frame where you're like, I don't like to do much silviculturally. I don't like to use a lot of herbicides, a lot of site prep. I'm just not gonna do much. I'm gonna thin it a couple times, maybe that's it. Don't waste your money going expensive on genetics because you're not gonna get these game numbers. But if you're gonna manage intensively, really invest and try to make maximum financial return and you've got a good or above average site, the better the genetics, the more you're gonna make. So this of course also factors into risk. You're spending more at establishment. We could lose any stand, right? A hurricane comes through, um, you know, they're building some railroad now between Houston and Dallas, right? If your property gets eminent domain, you know, who knows what could happen, right? Over the next 25 years. So you could always lose the whole stand. So it plays into risk tolerance too. But basically the take home message is in most situations, the better genetics yield better money. So any questions on this? I know that's kind of complicated, but you all can look at it when I post the slides. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left. And so what I want to wrap up with, uh, for those of you that are going to take intensive silviculture next semester with me, uh, so those are the urban forestry majors and the timber management majors, uh, I'll hope you get you out boots on the ground at a bare root nursery here in East Texas. So you all get to see all this. Um, typically during a, a normal field station, we take you all out to a container nursery. That obviously didn't happen this past summer for those in field station then and right now. Um, but I want to go over what happens in a typical bare root nursery. Uh, so you'll have some awareness there. So we're planting seedlings in the ground, and then at some point we're going to rip them out of the ground and sell them to someone. Do you want a clay soil texture? No, you do not. The other thing to keep in mind is you have to operate out on this nursery 12 months a year. So you don't want water ponding. You want that water to drain quickly so that it's operable. So you can see the sandy texture to this nursery right here. All the equipment you're going to see is modified ag equipment. It's all tractors. So we're not doing this with skitters or fellers or anything like that. This is agriculture to grow little baby trees. That's what we're doing. And so you want a sandy site. They put them on a 2-2 rotation. And so they will grow seedlings on a site two years in a row. And then they'll leave the site fallow for two years, growing a cover crop on it, something like wheat, that they can then mulch in to build back organic matter in that soil. So the Arbor Gen nursery that they have in Bullard, Texas, not far from here, it's 140 acres. They're only growing seedlings on 70 million of those acres because half of it's in production in a given year, which means they're growing 50 million seedlings on 70 acres. It's about the most productive agricultural system in the world in terms of the number of crops you can grow per acre. So incredible high density there. So we've really figured this out pretty well. So once you're bringing one of your acres out of its two year fallow period, you have to control competition. So this is competition from other plants, but this is also different pests that are gonna cause problems with your seedlings. Um, I talked to someone who was managing the Jasper nursery back when Campbell owned it a few years ago. Um, and this was the guy managing the nursery. He'd been there for a long time. So he said when he was a kid, when he was a teenager, they spent all summer, every summer, doubled over out in the nursery beds, pulling grass out and throwing grass out by hand. You don't see them doing that in a modern nursery anymore. What they'll use is methyl bromide, uh, which is a pesticide that kills just about anything. Plant, insects, uh, kills pretty much anything. It's a gas, so they'll tarp the surface, then spray the, the gas in there, and it'll only go so deep. So sometimes like nematodes will go too deep and it won't get them, and then they'll come up and munch on the roots, but it gives them pretty darn good control. This is an extremely deadly chemical. You know, you have to be very careful with this. This can kill people. It's very toxic. Um, California and other states are looking to ban this. And so hopefully we don't lose it in our nurseries in the South. It makes a major difference in how efficient their operations can be. And again, this is not a good chemical uh, to have out in the environment, but we're talking about doing this on like a thousand acres Southwide um, in a given year. So we're not talking about doing this over vast landscapes. Uh, very targeted usage. 
Okay, then they'll take an ag tractor and they'll, they'll form a bed that's basically the width right between the tires. Um, and you can note the irrigation out there. They have pipes out there with uh, sprinkler heads poking up above ground. It's a sandy site, it's well drained, so they're gonna need to irrigate it well to keep those seedlings in good shape. And then they'll sow seed. And I've already mentioned this, they typically do this in April around here. And so they have a drill seeder out there and this is all modified ag equipment. So if you ever wanna work at a nursery, they recommend you be pretty handy mechanically because a lot of your time is spent, you know, getting this equipment maintained, modified, adapted, honed in, so you get your operation working right. So they put in various drill lines there. They'll have maybe eight drill lines per bed. And here they are out there in that metal frame. They just know the area on that metal frame. It's a fixed area. And so they'll make sure they have the right number of seeds per square foot. So they know how wide the nursery bed is. So they often think about how many seedlings they're growing per foot of nursery bed. Uh, but it's gonna be a lot of seedlings. They pack them in there. Dr. Williams, our Dean, has done a lot of research uh, looking at how to fertilize nurseries, uh, but they will absolutely fertilize them multiple times a year with nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients. Some nurseries can put that in with the irrigation and fertigate, but you've got them fertilized. They'll mulch them. Uh, the mulch is some organic matter that helps the seedling grow well, but it also minimizes predation by birds. Uh, so that can be a problem. And then by mid to late summer, you've got a nice crop of seedlings. It almost looks like a hedge. You can't see each individual tree. Um, once they hit winter dormancy, you'll see them go kind of reddish sometimes, and that's fine. That's just them going dormant. But they're going to prune them multiple times. They're going to basically literally mow them. It's neat when you see the container nursery at IFCO, they have beds on tables about this high. Um, and then they have the containers on, a, on all those raised frames. So they actually have basically just a normal lawnmower but it's up on this metal frame they can wheel over the, the tables and move the mower back and forth. But here they'll have basically just a mower on the back of that tractor and they'll mow the seedlings to keep them from getting too tall. We'll talk next class about how you want just the right root shoot ratio. And so they're controlling that by mowing the tops. Um, then they'll run one bar underneath the bottom and they'll sever the tap root at a certain depth. And that's because when you have hand planters or machine planters out with your seedlings, if they have too big a root system, they won't get it all in the hole. And we'll see next class that doesn't work well. That doesn't lead to good outcomes. Um, they will lateral prune them where they'll run bars down in between the drill lines so that when you get all these seedlings out, they're not all stuck together. You cut the lateral roots that have all grown together. And so you'll prune them several times and then you lift them. Uh, the nursery, I believe it's owned by FRC now and Jasper, they hand lift everything. So they have crews just pulling the seedlings out by hand. The nursery in Bullard, they uh, machine lift everything. And so this machine that's drawn by this tractor is set up to pull the seedlings up, shake the dirt off them and feed them up that conveyor belt. And another tractor will pull a hopper down the next row and they'll all go into that hopper. And then they have a hand crew behind there picking up a few straggler seedlings that misses. You see all these people are in coats and hoodies and everything. Uh, this crew is in a giant refrigerator. It's about 38 degrees in there. You have to keep these seedlings cold to keep them healthy and alive. So what they're doing is they're counting them. They may sort some of them by size. They box them up. And again, they're boxing them mostly by weight. Um, and those boxes they've got are wax coated so they can stay wet um, and not fall apart. So hang out in the refrigerator all day during this season, box up 50 million seedlings, and then that's a temporary job. Uh, the school will move on to other work. And so there the boxes are stored in the nursery. And so if things go well, they may lift them a week or two before you need them. You come pick them up, keep them cold until you get them in the ground. So, and we'll talk about what happens after you pick up the seedlings next class. So that's it. Any questions on bare root nurseries?